So can you tell me a little bit about the Ice Cube project and what it's trying to do? So we're essentially we're building the world's largest neutrino detector and we're instrumenting a large volume of ice in Antarctica uh, with light sensors and we're looking for cosmic neutrinos passing through the Earth with the idea of doing a new form of astronomy with those particles. So why did they want to locate it in such a lo remote location? Uh, because we need a large volume of transparent material. The neutrinos are very weakly interacting, so you need a huge amount of material to see eff effectively any of them. Uh, and it has to be transparent because we're looking at the light that's generated when the neutrinos interact in the ice or near the ice. So when I was talking to you, this is literally about as south as you can get, right? It's yes. just off the South Pole Station. It's at the South Pole, yeah, at the geographic South Pole. So how does the data get from there back home to where it's useful? Well, we tape, we tape everything. We have a, a lo about a terabyte per hour, I think, of raw data that gets taped. But we have a very uh, extensive filtering farm there where we reduce the data quite a bit, and that gets sent daily over uh, a satellite that's run by NASA. It's called the TDRS Satellite Network. And, and that's so that the same gets, one the shuttles use, right? Yes, in fact, we have to share with the shuttle, and sometimes we miss a pass because the shuttle, I, well, used to, I should say, used yeah. to use, uh, yeah. So, the, well, first of all, how does, I mean, it's not actually at the station, it's sort of, it says like, what, 600 yards or something? Yeah, it's 800 meters or so right. away, yeah. So, how is it getting, how are they powering the, the detector itself, and how is it getting, do they have just a big cable running between them? Right, right. They don't have a generator right there. They may have backup generators while they're doing operations there, but there's, the station has a, a power plant with three different power generators that are redundant, and there, there are cables going underneath. It's actually, it goes underneath the skiway where the plan, planes land and uh, gets to our electronics. Now, one issue I would think is that for, what is it, about six months a year, or, or possibly a little less, you really can't get down there. Right, yes, the, 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 the flights to the South Pole are run by the New York Air National Guard, and they don't like to fly when it gets below about 50 below Fahrenheit. So that means that for eight months out of the year, the people who are there are just there. So I would imagine that you have to be very fault tolerant on your equipment requirements because getting a spare in there is going to be tricky. Right, sparing is, is always an issue. So we have, we, we keep a sparing inventory. We, we try to have enough spare fans and discs and whole units, uh, whole server units. Uh, we have custom electronics that we built for the communicating with the stuff that's in the ice. We have spares of all of that stuff too. So yeah, it's, but it's you can always run out, and there's a danger that at some point you have to improvise or run with reduced capacity. Now you said you you are able to get down there during the the summer months. Is there someone on site in the in the winter months who's kind of responsible for its care and feeding? Yes, we have two winter over scientists. The last several years we've had two scientists that are there. They come for the whole year. Everybody else leaves uh, around the middle of February. So do you, do you stay down there during the summer or do you kind of pop in and pop out? Um, I've been down typically for about a month at a time. And uh, it's the, the, the people who stay the longest in the summer tend to be the drillers uh, because the drilling is a big operation and they, they, we actually have a lot of manpower in the summer, it's a, we, we actually are one of the biggest sources of population at the South Poles. Essentially, the drillers required to put these strings in the ice that we're deploying down in the ice. Now, do they actually have like a data center there, or is everything kind of ad hoc? Well, it's it's our data center, really? uh, so it's somewhat homegrown. But it's you know it's it would be recognizable to most of the people. Right, here but it isn't like they have a, a, a conditioned machine room and you just dropped your rack in it, is it? Oh uh, no, they built us a they built us a lab sort of on it's on a little bit of a platform, um, and we have we have about 150 server nodes in racks in that room. Now normally the problem in a server room is trying to keep things cool. Is is it yes. the inverse there? Well, it's yes, it's. It, 
it's actually uh, keeping things cool is, can be surprisingly hard there as well, um, because partly because you have you know the outside is so cold, especially in the winter, uh, that you can't just like blow the air on mass into the electronics. It has to be conditioned. You have to carefully. You, we've had problems where, for example, where vents would freeze shut or freeze open. If it freezes shut, then everything overheats. So it's uh, we we don't actually worry directly about that. The 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 service contractor for the Antarctic program takes care of that for us, but we have to keep an eye on it as well because of the, just for the health of the electronics. As far as getting the data back, you're kind of in the same boat as, as like a, a uh, space probe in that you've got limited windows. I think you said the latency is very high on the data you're getting back. How, how have you had to adapt to that? Well, we, we can't just get data, as you said, we can't just get data back instantly uh, under most circumstances. So we, have, we use the Iridium network for some of our data transport. Uh, we can get small amounts of data, so just to tell that things are running. That's like telemetry type it, of thing. Basically telemetry. And so our latencies typically are of the order of a few minutes. Uh, and so it's, it's good enough to actually, you can actually sit there and interact with the instrument. Um, but it's, it takes some, some patience. It's not like just logging into a server in Colorado and typing commands. Um, but the bulk of our, you know, the, the large amount of data that's collected for scientific analysis is staged every day and sent over these daily satellite passes. And that's kind of a bulk compressed yeah, transmission. Yeah. yeah, it's not even TCP IP. It's some custom protocol that they use at NASA. Now, once the data gets back here, where here is, is North America. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that it's a consortium of, of different institutions that are involved in this. How do you get the data available to them efficiently? So there's a data center in Madison, Wisconsin, which uh, we have a sort of data warehouse, which stores all the filtered data, as well as, uh, for example, simulated data that we use for scientific analysis. And uh, so there's a fairly big amount of capacity in Madison to keep a couple of years worth of data online, and of course we can always go back to tape too. The tapes come back at the end of the at the end of the winter, um, but that's basically it's this, we, it's this other data center in Madison that most of the people use uh, to come in and do their analysis. There are also some other data centers in Europe, for example, that where they have copies of the data so for security, and they can also do analysis there. But it's basically so it's not so much you're making the data available and then people are downloading it. It's more of it you're hosting computational resources that they can use. Right. The, un, until you really crunch the data down and still a lot of data, it's more than you would just copy to your laptop. Um, once you've gone through a few levels of filtering, then you can just pass it around, essentially. It, it's, I've been out of the analysis part of it for a while, but that's my understanding. Um, now, when you mentioned tapes, I, I mean... First of all, these, these, it gets to the station before it's put on tape. They're not trying to, uh, the, the tapes aren't out on the ice. Well, the tapes are, right, the tapes are, well, I think the tapes are still in the station. Um, yes, they, they have, certainly have been for most of the time. Right. There are problems with tape drives at the pole because uh, the humidity is essentially zero. And so you have static charge buildup and we, we've had, uh, had a lot of problems with tape drives. Just keeping Are these like DAT drives or? Uh, they're LTO4 type. I'm not really sure what the yeah. what the form factor is anymore, but. Uh, but they're, they're basically high capacity. Right, high drives. capacity cartridge right. drives, yeah. So uh, is, is useful data, I mean, you're, you're not involved in the scientific side of it, so. I not so much. I keep an eye on it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but are they getting, starting to get useful data out of this and Yes, yeah, I mean, we're, a lot of the game so far has been setting the limits on uh, various kinds of astrophysical phenomenon. Um, I, there, there have been some discover, you know, sort of interesting things come out of it that are not any big deal. I'm not sure what the public status of it is, so sure. I probably shouldn't go too much into it, but uh, it's, it's, we're still, we're actually still finishing the construction phase. We have one more season to go. And it's a 15-year project, so it'll. There's a long cycle for the analysis of, of the instrument's data, and you know we all hope that we'll see some very interesting stuff soon. Well, John, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you very much, James.